and also at home, Brother uh, Oliver, and now TJ's kind of running, the, and that's where my wife is tonight. She has the kids at home. They're both under the weather, so I ask that you remember them. So it just kind of snowballed one to another. Amen. So we want to keep those in prayer. Amen. And believe in God that he's able to touch them. Amen. Looking forward to seeing the Hernandez uh, back in church. Sorry that they're not here tonight, not feeling well. We missed them while they're gone. And I was thinking last night as I was walking into prayer meeting that it's almost been since about July 11. I think that's when Pastor left on his trip. That it's been since July 11th that somebody at some point, and this is not bad, I mean, it, it happens, but it, somebody's been on vacation or somebody's been sick. And I was thinking, uh, well, maybe this weekend everybody's going to be home and we can all rejoice and be thankful that everybody's home. Now, Brother Reno and Sister Leslie are going to be, be leaving before long, but they have an obligation that they need to go take care of. So we're going to pray God keeps his hand upon them. Amen. But I don't think they're leaving until around the 14th is what he told me, or maybe the 15th right after the 14th. Amen. So we're going to ask God to keep his hand up on them. Amen. Bring them back safe. Amen. Do you love this smile? There's just something about it. I love to be happy. I really do. I kind of made a New Year's resolution this last year, not the beginning of 24, but 23. I remember specifically telling some some asked me, said, well, what are you going to make for a resolution? And I said, well, I said, I pretty much have given up on the diet resolution because it lasts about, it lasts about a week and about 68 times of that failing, you kind of are dreading to say, yeah, I'm going to lose weight this year. And, uh, but I remember vividly saying, telling my wife, I want to smile more. I want to laugh more. We had just gone through a couple of years of uh, tough times, it seemed like, with COVID and all those things that went along with it. Many of us lost friends and loved ones, and it just seemed like a tough time. And I just told my wife, I want to be happy. I want to smile. Amen. And I said that to say this. My famous saying is this. I heard something on Facebook today, and I've just got to share it with you. Brother Jaime, I want you to stick this in your back pocket because nobody can tell a joke like Brother Jaime can tell a joke. But it was this man decided, him and his wife, him and his bride were going to go to the Holy Land. And uh, they booked the trip. They got everything together. And uh, they decided they were going to take, the, they, they were gonna take the mother-in-law with them on this trip. And uh, so they get over in the Holy Land and they're traveling around and they're enjoying life, having fun and everything. But something happens to the mother-in-law and she passes away. And uh, they were grieving in their heart, but they said, well, we got to see what we can do about it. So they go to their funeral director, and they tell the funeral director this situation, uh, told them where they live back in the United States. And he said, well, he says, let me give you a couple of options. He said, number one, you can have her uh, body shipped back to your, your city, your state where you live in there. And uh, it, would, it would be about $5,000. And he said, wow, he began to think of that and count the dollars in his head. And he said, or the man gave him the second option. He said, or you can have her buried here. And it would only be about $150. And the guy began to compare. Wow, $150 or $5,000. What do I think would be the best bet? And finally he said, you know what? He said, we'll just pay the $5,000. The guy said, well, he said, I that's your choice. Is it just kind of a sentimental thing that you'd like to have uh, your, your mother-in-law close to you? You guys can go visit the grave and so forth. He said, no, it's, it's not a, a sentimental thing at all. And he said, well, pray tell me, what is it? And he said, well, about 2,000 years ago, he said, a man was buried here in this country. And three days he rose again. I just can't take that chance with my ex or my mother-in-law. I hope you don't feel that way, Brother Aaron. He said, I just can't take a chance. Amen. Whenever I read that, I laughed. And I said, you know what? I'm going to share that tonight. I started to tell my wife at home. And I thought, nah, I'm going to wait and let her hear it in church tonight. But anyway, it's good to laugh. It's good to have fun. Amen. That's why I like to go with Brother Jaime anywhere. Anywhere you go, you're going to laugh and have fun. 
we went on a cruise a number of years ago with Brother Jaime and Sister Leon, and we laughed from the time we got on the boat till we got off the boat. Three and a half days of laughing. One day morning, I was so sore from laughing that my stomach was sore because we had stayed up late that night, uh, the night before, laughing, and we couldn't stop laughing. But uh, it's, it's just good. And that's one thing about being with God's people. We were with some friends on Sunday, and we laughed. We had a great time. A guy was entertaining us, singing songs, love songs to me and my wife for our anniversary, and we just had a blast. We had a good time. Amen. I, life is too short. You know what I realize, Brother Juan, I, as I'm getting older, I want to take advantage of every single day. Amen. I, I'm telling you that. That's the way I feel. Every day that I wake up, I want to say, God, what have you got in store for me today? Because I'm anxious to receive from it. Amen. From you. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, I guess we need to turn some, to some spiritual aspects of this. Thank you, Pastor, for asking me to fill in tonight for you. Amen. Was, was how do I say, was Sunday morning message incredible? I'm telling you, Sunday morning message that Brother Bodhi preached was absolutely incredible. For you that, that were in Sunday school, I hope you've had the chance uh, to go in and hear it. If you have not, I encourage you to go in and listen. It's just a fabulous, fabulous message. It was such an encouraging and uplifting message. Amen. We want to turn to Second Chronicles tonight. I'm just going to read one verse, but I am going to ask you to uh, go ahead and, and leave it there because uh, we're going to be dealing with this chapter in just a little while. It's Second Chronicles chapter number 26 and verse number 1. It says this, Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old. Are any of you, I don't guess there's anybody 16. The girls, you're 14. Is anybody 16 in here? Anybody in the back? Brother McGill started to raise his hand. No, Brother McGill. Um, he was 16 years old, and they put him in as king and made him king in the room of his father, Amaziah. Amen. A 16-year-old boy was placed as the king over his, or Judah. Amen. Let's take a moment to pray. Let's ask God to move tonight. Would you pray? Savior, we love you. We thank you. We appreciate you, God. We adore you, God. Hallelujah. We're asking today, God, that you would move, that you would have your way in this place today, God. Give us directions, we pray tonight. Hallelujah. Let every heart, every life be stirred and touched today by your word. We love you, Jesus. We thank you. We appreciate you, Lord. Glory to your name. Amen. In your wonderful name, we pray today. Hallelujah. God bless you. You can be seated tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to talk tonight and direct your attention to this portion of Scripture. We're going to, as I said, we're going to talk about it a little bit later on. But there are basically two kinds. Well, th actually, there's another one even that's a little bit different than this one. I borrowed this one from pastor's office tonight before church. I went in there and got this one. But uh, this is one that Brother Gomes spoke highly of. Uh, because he said, whenever you're sitting down, whenever you go to get up, he says, you can use that cane to pull yourself up. And uh, true, uh, tonight, whenever I come up the steps, carrying it in here from the office, I used it and I was able to climb up on the stair a little bit easier than I normally do. But there's this kind. I, I don't know how comfortable I would feel with this kind. And then there's another one that is like this. You're probably going to have to take that so it doesn't flop around. There's another one like this that kind of has the candle or handle on it. And it is that this, this particular one is one that you see a lot of people use. There's one, I don't know if yours is, has it that way, Brother uh, Jose, but there's one of them that I like that's aluminum that has three prongs on it. And that it looks much more secure than this. But some have said, well, Brother O'Brien, we know you've got bad knees. Why do you not use a cane? And uh, they accused me the other day of maybe having a little bit too much pride to carry a cane around. But I've always felt this way. Both of my knees are bad. So which side do I use it on? 
You know what I'm talking about, Sister Bodie. When you have both knees bad, if you, if you favor one side, that, the other side is going to start getting sore. So what do you do then? Do you just switch the sides? I don't know. But you have the people that use them religiously, that depend on them. They lean on this thing for support. They, they trust this thing that it's going to support their weight whenever they go to lean on it. And they may be able to put all of their strength, all of their weight on that. But it, it's this way. If, if I was leaning on this thing and Brother Chris came along and kicked that thing out from under me, kick it out, you know what would happen to me? I would fall flat on my face. Because what I was leaning on and trusting in was no longer there. Tonight I want to ask you this question as a church. What are you leaning on today? What are you leaning on today? The story that we read in this uh, particular portion of Scripture talked about Uzziah. The name Uzziah meant Jehovah is my strength. I'm here to tell you today that I am glad to say I can stand before you today and tell you that Jehovah God is my strength. God Almighty is my strength. It's not my own ability, not my own power, not my own ingenuity, but it's by His power that I'm able to overcome and live a pleasing life to Him. I need Him in my life. I need His strength. Amen. Not my strength, not somebody else's, but I need His strength. Amen. You've heard Pastor just recently talk about this, and I just want to rehearse a little history for you as we get started in this message tonight. It was a, it was a very critical time in the southern kingdom. Remember, they had already been divided now. You had the ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes. The two southern tribes was Judah and Benjamin. And it was that it seemed like they had a little bit better run of kings. And it seemed like that they had a little bit better success than what Israel had. At this particular time, Israel had already pretty much gone into anarchy where they were going from one king to another. And it just seemed like every king was a little worse than the previous one. But the, the southern kingdom also, at that time, Amaziah, which was Uzziah's father, was the one that had risen to the throne of Judah and was ruling and doing a pretty good job. The Bible said that he started out by doing that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. I don't care how man looks at me, friend. I want to make sure that what I'm doing is right in the eyes of the Lord. It may not go along with the popular society that we live in, but I'm telling you what, it's important that we are doing the right thing in the eyes of God. And it was that he got off to a good start, but somewhere along the line, he was influenced by idols that had, he had allowed to come into Judah. And it was that pretty soon that they pretty much ran him out of Judah, and he was chased into Lachish, and there he was killed. And then, as it was, this particular boy, this Uzziah, was the one that was in line to be the king. He was only 16 years old at the time. And it was that he ascended, to, he was able to ascend to the throne of Judah and become the uh, heir apparent to the kingdom. And then I want to read the story, go into a little bit more depth of what we begin to read tonight. Then the verse number one, going back to that, and it says, Then all the people uh, of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the room of his father, Amaziah. He filled that position that his, his dad had filled as king of Judah. He said he built Eloth and restored it unto Judah. This was a very important thing. Eloth was a city that David had went in and conquered and won. And they had allowed it through the years to go back into the power of the Philistines and some of the other enemies of Israel. But he went in and retook that city. It was a very important city. It was a city of commerce. It was a city that was located by the sea, so there was many ships that could sail, and they had commerce that could go back and forth. So business-wise, it was a very, and a strategic uh, 
place for them to be able to, it was even Solomon whenever he was a king and that he, it was still under their reign there and he built many ships that they could transport goods back and forth and also carry the army if it needed to be. So it was very important that he went back and he built Eloth and restored it unto Judah. After the king had slept with his fathers, David had, had conquered that city and, and it was going back to his old. It said, verse 3, 16 year old was Uzziah when he began to reign, and he reigned, listen to this, 50 and two years in Jerusalem. See, one of the things that benefited Judah so very much is it still had the capital of Jerusalem. Even yet today, Jerusalem is about the most important thing to a Jew. If you ask them what the most important thing is, they will almost, without hesitation, tell you that it's Jerusalem. It was the previous administration went back in and, and put our offices there back into Jerusalem where they belonged instead of Tel Aviv uh, where they did not belong. So it was a, a, a power thing that was a, a good thing for the United States to go back and do that. But this 52 years that he reigned in Jerusalem were some of the most prosperous times. And I want you to understand what I'm, where I'm going to drive at a little bit later on. But this was about the most prosperous time. It was a good time whenever David was king. He, was, he reigned for some 40 years. And whenever you talk about a king of Israel, where do you usually talk about first? Of course, he had all 12 tribes together whenever he was the king. But it, it was that it was a very prosperous time. But it, it, during this 52 years in Jerusalem uh, or in Judah, it was such a powerful, wonderful time for them that the people rejoiced and they loved him. Uh, Uzziah said his mother's name also was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the size of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah did. Again, he's following in the first part of his father's footsteps of following after the Lord and following and doing that which was right in his life. His life. In verse 5, listen to this. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, the preacher. He did, he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Friend of mine, I'm here to tell you this evening that if you will follow after God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, I'm telling you, God will help you to prosper and to get ahead in this life. And he will bless you beyond measure, friend. But it, the key to that is learning to follow him and, and to seek after the Lord. And God will honor that and prosper, let you be prospered. Verse 6, and he went forth and warred against the Philistines. And break down the wall. You know what? In, in these times, the Bible times, you know what one of the most important things to these cities were? Their walls. Because it offered protection from the enemy. That the enemy could not get in. They could look at those walls and they could see those walls there. And they knew that that was a barrier between them and the enemies that would come in to destroy. I'm here to tell you today that there's no weapon that can be formed against you that is able to conquer you as long as you'll stay right with God and let God use you. God will take care of your every battle. Every battle. It doesn't matter how big. It doesn't matter what the battle is. God is able to bring you victorious through every fight, every obstacle that lies in your way. David should have been overwhelmed by the giant, but he wasn't because he knew that he had gone out in the name of the Lord and God was going to deliver that giant. If there's a giant in your life tonight, I'm telling you, God is able to take care of that giant on your part and on your behalf. Hallelujah. The Philistines, they were the number one enemy. The Arabians that dwelt in Gerubile and the Mahums, I don't know. Uh, your guess is as good as mine. And then the eighth, it said, and the Ammonites even came, the enemies even came and gave gifts to Uzziah. And his name spread abroad to every entering, out of, even out of Egypt, for he strengthened himself exceedingly. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem 
at the corner gate and at the valley gate and at the turning of the walls and fortified them. He said, also he built towers in the desert and dig many wells. He knew that if the people were going to be out in the desert, that they were going to have need of water. So he made provision for them, but not only for that, but he also, for he had much cattle, both in the low country and in the plains. He was a husbandman also, and vine dressers, and in, in the mountains, and in Carmel, for he loved husbandry. He loved plants, and he loved animals. What well, we would refer to somebody that was much into agriculture. He loved those things, being able to look out and see what he had accomplished and what he, what he had there available to him. He said then, he, but one of the things that Uzziah had was a huge army. Army, he had 2,600 captains who commanded 307,500 highly trained, well-equipped fighting men. This is the thing that brought them a safe feeling that they felt that everything was going to be all right because of the, the army that they had. But listen, he said they had shields, they had spears, they had helmets, they had body armor, they had bows, they had slings to cast stones, and he had made some engines that they could take large stones and cast those stones off the top of those walls and shoot arrows and great stones at the enemy. The, uh, in this verse 15 tells us that his name spread abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. Marvelously helped. God brought him along, and God prospered him. He kept his hand on him, on him and also on Judah. You could look at it this way, that Uzziah was definitely the hope of Israel. He was a king that had the intelligence, the ability to make Judah a great nation. And he had made Judah a great nation. And with God's help, he gave him the wisdom to use that knowledge and that ability. God had blessed him. Each day it was as they, people would wake up, Brother Reno, and say, well, let's see what God's got in store for us today. Something good is going to happen today. Something as wonderful is about to take place. Their land that they had was productive, very productive. Their homes were safe from the enemy. They didn't have to worry about the enemy coming in to destroy them. They were happy because of the king that was just sitting on the throne. Uzziah made everything okay. He was wonderful. It would be if the story ended on verse number 15. It would be wonderful if the story stopped there. But unfortunately, forgive me. I had a timer going here. But forgive me. The, the sad thing was, and I've used this before, this illustration, in Second Chronicles 26, 16, it says this. It uses that awful word, three-letter word, but. But. This, what it does is it pretty much throws out everything that Uzziah had accomplished. All the good things that he had done for God and achieved for God, you might as well throw them out the window because now the most important thing is what was going to be said after this conjunction of this little three-letter word of but. Said but, when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the He had transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Uzziah had no business. He, he was, he was for, it wasn't his job. It wasn't his obligation to go in. It belonged to the priest, the preacher, to go in and offer up incense or sacrifice in the temple. But Uzziah took it upon himself to say, no, I, I don't need the preacher. A friend of mine, I, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I'll say it to the day that I pass away. I think we've got to have a pastor in our lives in order to be saved. That's how strong I feel about it, that I want a pastor in my life 
that is able to watch over my soul. The Bible refers to as the watchman. And he's watching over my soul to give me directions for my life, to help me. Yes, I have a connection with God. I'm able to connect with him. But God put a shepherd in our lives to help lead us and guide us. But it was at this point that he decided he didn't need the shepherd. He didn't need the man of God in his life. He took it all upon himself because of the word pride. The, the Word of God does not mince words whenever it talks about pride. For it says, pride goeth before a fall, and a haughty spirit before destruction. It was pride that caused Samson to believe that time after time, he could go back and lay in Delilah's lap and be able to overcome the enemy. Until one day he dis discovered that he was no longer able to do it. It was pride that drove him to that place. It was pride that caused Belshazzar to go, feel like that he could bring in the artifacts from the temple. And as a mockery to God, drink out of those things and have to see the handprint writing on the wall. It was pride that brought about his destruction and he lost his kingdom during that time. It was pride that caused Pharaoh to go after the children of Israel after they had left Egypt. It was pride that drove him to said, I cannot let these people go. I will have to go after them and destroy them. And you know the story there of how that God destroyed that army that was trying to follow them. It was pride that caused Ananias and Sapphira to feel that they could fool the Holy Ghost and go against the man of God and God struck them dead in the temple. I'm telling you, friend of mine, if you're not careful and you let pride get into your life, it can affect everything in your life. Everything that you do, pride can have a say-so in your life, whether you want it to or not. One of the things that God was so upset, I think I mentioned this the last time that I was speaking, that I was so upset about the church of Laodicea. They were so self-confident and self-righteous and prideful in their own way that it was to their own destruction. He said, you're poor, you're wretched, you're blind, you're naked. He accused him of all of those things, but it was pride that caused him to reach that point. I'm telling you, a friend of mine, and it was pride that caused Uzziah to feel like he could go back into the temple and walk into the temple and offer up a sacrifice. He tempted God, and he lost. That's exactly what happened. He tempted God, and he lost at it. The story goes that the high priest come to him, and he come into the temple. He approached Azariah, the high priest of Judah, and he brought along 80 priests with him. The Bible said that they were upright men, and they were valiant men, and it was that these men had to take a stand. Do you realize the jeopardy that they were placing their lives in? To walk up to the king that very easily could have told them, told his guards or whatever, have these men killed. Have them killed. Take them out and, and, and kill them. I don't want to hear what they've got to say. But he became so angry and so mad at Azariah for making a stand against him. It was kind of like he was saying, who do you think you are? You're just a preacher. You're just a nobody. I'm the king of this, this nation. I'm the one that has a right to do this. And from the time that he said that, leprosy began to strike his face and his hand, and he was covered in leprosy. From that moment on, friend, he lost his kingdom. He lost everything because of the pride and doing something that wasn't in the will and the plan of God. Amen. He was cursed with leprosy. His position as a king was gone. It no longer existed. It was as though he died to everything and everybody at that time. Have you ever felt that way? Or something that you depended on so much that you leaned on, that maybe it was a crutch for you, that no longer do you feel that way to you. Maybe it was a job that you felt so secure in your job, and you felt like it was the best thing 
in your life, your job, you could, you said, I could always lean on my job. It will always be there. But there are many people that have walked into job situations and the boss looked them in the face and said, I'm sorry, you no longer have a job at this place. We have determined that you no longer work for us. And they lose their job and all of their benefits and everything that they felt so secure to lean on. Maybe it is that it's a spouse that has let you down. Maybe it is even a church that has left you down. And per adventure, maybe even a pastor at one time or another may have let you down. But what are you going to, what are those things in life that you tend to put uh, uh, your trust in? What are you leaning on today? What are you leaning on? Uh, are you going to re- rely on the uh, things of this world? is. Do you want to put your strength in, in money? From the years of 2018 to 2022, there were, this, to start with Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo closed 1,286 branches. U.S. Bank Corp closed 963 branches. Bank of America Closed, 739. There's a number of them here, but between that five years, I won't read them all, but between that five years, there was 5,730 branches closed. You want to put your trust in banks? You say, but oh, I've got FDIC. I'm, I'm insured. Friend, if these things start collapsing, do you know there was a major, major failure or collapse of three banks in 2023? The Silicon Valley Bank the Signature Bank, and the First Republic Bank. Those planes didn't just close their branches. They closed. Now, do you want to be able to say, that's what I'm leaning on today? Do you want to lean on the political system that we're in? It's so crazy and turned upside down right now. I'm telling you, that when I hear some of the things that are proposed and some of the things that's talked about, they want to put an unrealized capital gains tax. Do you know what that means? That means if your house escalated 20% in value in a year, if it went up 20%, you would have to pay taxes on that 20%. If your car, if property, if whatever that you had would go up, those are some of the things that they're looking at right now as we speak. Amen. You want to put your trust? You want to lean on those things? Friend, they're shaky. You don't want to put your trust in those things. You don't want to depend on those things. But it was as though the people had totally depended upon Uzziah. It was as though they, and and Isaiah, we're going to read a portion of a scripture in just a second here, but Isaiah saw the desperation of the people of Judah. He saw that their loss of their hope that they had in King Uzziah was no longer there. He was gone. They, They felt like they were rudderless now. They had nobody to lead them or to guide them and direct them. They felt so vulnerable to this world and all the things that were going on, the condition. They were afraid that no longer would they be safe from the armies of that time because Uzziah was no longer. They did not realize. They did not understand. It was not Uzziah. It was not Uzziah's strength that kept them safe. It was not Uzziah's strength that kept them protected. It was not Uzziah that kept all their lands uh, fertile and all the things going on there. But it was God Almighty, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He was the one that was able to help them through every situation and every time. They misunderstood who was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Isaiah chapter number 6, verse number 1 through 4. This is such a beautiful, beautiful setting, setting of Scripture. I love it. Isaiah was close to Uzziah. They were cousins. Uzziah's dad and Isaiah's dad were brothers. They were first cousins. And they were not only related, but history tells us, They were very close. I have some cousins that I'm as, Kayla will back up what I'm saying, that I'm as close to them as I would be any brother if I had a brother. 
That's how close we are. But it was that they were very close. They had a relationship there. So I'm sure that there was something in the heart of Isaiah that began to suffer a little whenever Uzziah went through that and failed miserably. And, and he ended up being buried in a place where they only bury lepers and those that are sick. He couldn't even be buried where the kings, where kings were buried. They wouldn't let him be buried there to shame him even worse. But it was that Isaiah sit down in Isaiah chapter number 6, verse number 1. It says this, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train, yeah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I don't know about you, but Isaiah saw a different picture than what the nation of Judah did. Judah no longer was able to see a king sitting on the throne named Uzziah. But Isaiah was able to look up into the heavens and get a little different view. Church, sometimes it's good for us just to get a little bit different view. Yes, there may be things going on in our lives. Maybe there are situations that we wish didn't exist. But I'm here to tell you today, if you'll just look to him, if you'll look up for strength that can come from him, God is able to move. God is able to help you. Through every situation, he is high and lifted up and his train fills the temple. There is so much in these four verses. I want to try to hit just a little bit of each one. His train fills the temple. You see, whenever our church is filled with the presence of God, we don't have room, we don't have place for any other nonsense that maybe might want to go on or the devil wants to try to bring us. But we want, our present, we want God's presence to be filling this place so that there's not room for anything else. I want his presence to fill the tabernacle when I come in. Hallelujah. Let's try and fill the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. Is this beautiful? When twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. That he created. And if you would look at them, it would look almost as if they were flaming, that they were on fire. God doesn't want a lukewarm church, friend. I said, God don't want a lukewarm church, but he wants a church that's on fire, amen, that has things happening, going on whenever we walk through those doors, expecting something great to happen in the Holy Ghost. God wants us to be on fire. He don't want a dead church. I said, he don't want a dead church. I believe that we are a church of lively stones, that God desires that we have a church that is active, that is worshiping, that is loving him. Hallelujah. They had three sets of wings. One of them, they covered their face. One of them, they covered their feet. Just because it was a shame for them to stand there uncovered in the presence of Almighty God. He designed them that way. They would use two of them to fly and the other two to cover their feet because they were embarrassed to stand in front of the king. And it was, uh, it was that with twain he did fly and one cried unto another. This is the purpose that God made these seraphims. He said, and one cried unto the other. He said this. He said that, uh, that holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole Lord is full. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Amen. I'm so glad today to stand here and tell you today that I, whenever I look at this scripture, I begin to get excited about God and his ability to move into this. I don't know about you, but I would love it that somebody would be driving down the road and stop and pull in and say, wait a minute, there's something wrong. There's a fire burning on your roof, and there's nothing more than just the presence of an almighty God that is showing his presence in that form. I'm telling you today, God is able to do it. We've heard those stories. Why can it happen here? The very first part of this verse tells the key of what happened. In verse number one, in the year that King Uzziah died. In the year 
that that crutch that they had depended on, and maybe even Isaiah to a certain extent had depended on, and they were so secure because I got my, I got my cane here. Everything's going to be all right. I've got Uzziah, my, my cane. He's, he's my cane. He's my strength. He's my ability. And whenever that thing was kicked out from under him, it, but the first thing that happened, Josiah had to die. Now Isaiah could see what God wanted him to see. Is it that maybe there's some things in our heart and our life that need to die out first before we can get a real glimpse of what God wants to do for us and with us? Maybe it is there's something, maybe it is pride that's there in our hearts, our lives. Maybe it's we look around sometimes and say, oh, I've accomplished this. I've done this. I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I've, I'm this. I'm that. I'm so forth and so on. And, and maybe it is that pride has crept in unaware. Maybe there's a spirit of jealousy or, or something along that line to realize that it is keeping us from really seeing and understanding what God wants to do for our lives. You see, all along, God was in control, not Uzziah. God was Judah's source, not Uzziah. God was Judah's king, not Uzziah. God is our source, not your job, not your spouse, not the business you may have, not your church or your pastor or anything or anyone else. We've got to understand God has got it in control. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you tonight, friend, God is able to take care of. You see, God's power and provision is not diminished by man's troubles. It, it doesn't matter. God, our troubles, you think God is affected by our little troubles and problems? Not at all, friend. You see, the reason why is we can look at him as Jehovah Elohim, which he is the Lord God. We can look at him as Jehovah Mekadish, the Lord who makes holy. Jehovah Yaira, the Lord who sees and provides. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, my banner. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord of peace. El Elon, the most high God. Emmanuel, God is with us. Elohim. Uh, that God of eternity, El Eked, the one God. I'm here to tell you today, I'm glad that I know who he is. I'm glad that I know who he is, is, who he is today. My question is this today. We don't set up physical idols in front of us to bow down and to worship. We don't do that anymore. But is there something else in your life that you've got before God? Is there something else that you have placed before God in your life that you say, really, that's more important to me than God? You see, nothing can come between us and God, our relationship with him. I'm here to tell you today, what idols are we worshiping today? Be careful what you're leaning on. Because I'm telling you, if you're leaning on anything in this world, would you stand with me? If you're leaning on the things of this world, someday, somewhere along the way, they will fail. Money markets, stock market, you name it. Someday, friend, they're going to fail. I'm asking you a couple of questions tonight. This, number one is, is there something in your life that you have let get more important to you? Than God. And number two, what are, you let, what are you leaning on in your life and not allowing God to be the one you lean on? You see, I put my trust, I put my confidence not in the things of this world, but I put my confidence in trusting God. I can lean on Him, Brother Daniel, and everything's going to be all right. I don't understand it in my own little feeble mind, but I know that God's got it in control. Maybe there's something in your heart, in your life today that is blocking you from seeing the Lord like he wants you to see. It's Paul that said it so well this way. Oh, that I may know him. Is there something in our lives and hearts today that's blocking us, keeping us from really knowing the Lord 
the way that he wants us to know him. I want to know him. Amen. I want to know him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Would you come this evening? Would you find a place to pray as they sing? Worship the Lord. I, I trust tonight. You more. I trust tonight that you will talk to the Lord.